If you think hiking only looks like this, it is time to reconsider. This is actually part of the trail, right? At some points you're on hardscape, so to speak. Pretty much, yeah. It's, it's a ratio between dirt trails and interesting street walks, too, that show you. On this day, our hike takes us through the city of Boston. Miles Howard is our guide. He's an author and journalist and the creator of the Walking City Trail. You don't have to own a car. You don't have to be up for rambling across a rocky ridgeline for miles. The 25-mile route begins at the Harvest River Bridge on the Neponset River. Hikers will pass through wooded trails, over pedestrian bridges, and along city sidewalks. Ultimately, they reach the Bunker Hill Monument in Charlestown. One thing, though, that distinguishes urban hiking from urban walking is that with an urban hike, it's not just about trying to get from point A to point B by foot. It's about trying to find one of the most scenically interesting ways to get here. Howard was inspired to create the trail after taking long walks through Boston during the pandemic and reading about a similar trail in San Francisco. All I could think was, man, Boston has so much sidewalk. We have so many parks and little green spaces. We could totally do this here too. So we've been in sort of dense woods and now, this is nice, we come out into a clearing. Yeah, this is the most lush I've seen this field since I started mapping the whole thing. Howard's route takes advantage of some popular places to find nature in the city. Jamaica Pond, Olmsted Park, the Charles River Esplanade, Boston Common. But there are also surprises, like a massive boulder near a rock tucked behind a neighborhood in Jamaica Plain. Often I hear, wow, I didn't know Boston had all these parks and green spaces. City infrastructure also has a role to play in this urban hiking adventure. I think one of the best things about urban hiking is that because it's in a city, because the trails are accessible via sidewalk and transit, there's a much wider spectrum of people who can hike the trail in theory. There are no signs for the trail. Hikers can get Howard's maps and directions online. He says the response has been positive. The real reward has been getting emails and direct messages from people who've gone out and hiked it on their own. This place was designed to be transporting. It is, in a way, the easiest vacation within Boston to come here and really discover another world. That world unfolds inside Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and there are opportunities to escape to that space for free. The Gardener is always free for anyone under 18. The other opportunity we have are first free Thursdays. Michelle Groey is the museum's Esther Stiles Eastman Curator of Education. She says during the pandemic, the museum team looked for more ways to offer free admission and decided on the first Thursday evening of each month. We felt it was really important to uh, make the museum as accessible as possible to as many folks and to not have admission as a barrier. The Gardner Museum also pays tribute to its founder, Isabella Stewart Gardner, with free admission for anyone named Isabella. Gardner always flaunted kind of the social decorum that was imposed on her as a 19th century woman. Diana Greenwald is assistant curator of the collection at the Gardner Museum and the co-author of an upcoming biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is actually the first purpose-built American museum founded by a woman. The museum's new wing hosts rotating exhibits. On this day, the art of author and illustrator Maurice Sendak. Many are familiar with Sendak for his best-known work, Where the Wild Things Are. As he said, around the age of 50, it's a good time to change your career or have a nervous breakdown and he decided to sort of change his career and become a stage designer. The exhibit showcases Sendak's sketches, dioramas, and actual sets from four operas. So you can really get a sense of these wonderful three-dimensional worlds that he was able to bring sort of from page to stage. And this is an exhibit designed for everyone to enjoy, whether it's grandparents who are an opera fan, you know, a 10-year-old kid who is a Sendak fan. Greenwald says there are a number of connections between Gardner and Sendak, including their shared love of opera, particularly Mozart's The Magic Flute. Sendak, who died in 2012, also once visited the museum. 
He gave a lecture here in 1991, and we know that he loved this museum. So he would have been thrilled to have his work on display here.